So if you are catching this on the back end, it's not live. Um, I accidentally clicked the start broadcast. And we discovered last time that I clicked the stop broadcast that it shuts it down and doesn't go to the site. Uh, it'll be a couple more minutes, so you can fast forward to the point and stop. We'll actually start with uh, this stuff over here. And uh, that will be the start point. So uh, I'll just be sitting here. And this All right. And go back. Okay, you guys all set? I think we're ready if you are. So you ready? I'm, not sure if I'm ready? All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn the display on. Well, folks, we're uh, starting that uh, promised webinar now between Steve Kearney and us. We have, base, have a few folks coming in from the uh, room next door. Just made an announcement to the back in there. So uh, those of you who'd like to watch this Web seminar, come up to the available seats here before the others come in from the next building. And uh, we're going to get started. I think it's about two minutes, I think, to give them the chance to come in. And the rest of you are welcome to join us up here. Let's see. One second, Steve. I'm still working on the audio here. No, no worries. I'm going to... I'll hang out with you. I'm going to put my... We're going to try. We're going to maybe try from there if we have to. I can relay. Okay. Put a few folks uh, gradually leading in here. About to begin now, Steve Curry is the chief maker of Mad Scientist, as he describes himself. Okay, we're ready. Steve's a native of Franklin, Eric Murphy, now living in California, where he runs a small company with his wife, Debbie, called Tabletop and Bay. That uh, company is dedicated to inspiring kids to be explorers, thinkers, innovators, and deep thinkers. I can't think of a more re remarkable way to spend your time. Good elbow is to help the group. Steve brought the inventor camp to our campus the past two summers and will be here again on the week of June 13th to share his love of making. And tonight he joins us by a state. Wave your hands if you can hear me. Excellent. I'm going to both them say hi. So hi, everybody. So this is Debbie. I'm Steve. Hi, Jay. Hi, everybody. Um, I didn't name myself a math scientist. Uh, Debbie did. Um, and I'm actually going to start off by showing you a couple of cool things, and then I'll play the story with you. And I'll apologize because uh, you guys are muted, and so if you say something, I won't hear you. But I'm going to ask Robbie to turn the... Uh, the, the the mute off after a bit for uh, some questions. Uh, how much time do I have? How much time do I have? Oh, ah, you can't you can't tell me because <laughs> their sound is off. 
Um, have Robbie send it in the chat. That way, uh, that way I don't like go over or something. All right. Uh, so I'm going to show you some 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 stuff. And I apologize. I'm in a hotel room because we're we're doing another Maker Fair tomorrow with all of our stuff. So we're at a hotel in Bergen. I drug some stuff down here to show you guys. Give me just a second. Um, uh, Debbie's going to run the camera, and uh, I'm going to show you some cool laser stuff. How many guys like lasers? Lasers. Oh, yes, lasers. All right. Um, so, I don't know if you can see this or not. Here. All right, so this right here, this thing, is a laser. And I don't know if you can see the dot on my hand. This is a helium neon laser. And uh, it's particularly good for measuring things. Now, this doesn't look like a, any ruler you've ever seen before, um, but uh, if you take this and like, kind of like this, there you go. See it? So the laser comes from here to this little dude again. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Here. Now this is called a bean splitter. And that's because, uh, oh, you can't see anything. Um, yeah, I should probably keep that. Um, and I should probably put something there. Uh, you can't stick your hand in the um, I'm going to stick my hand. All right. <laughs> um, so the laser comes this way, if you can see the dot on my hand here. And it hits this mirror, and it comes back to this little uh, beam splitter here. But the beam splitter not only sends some of the light this way, some of the light goes through the beam splitter, because that's why it's a splitter. So part of the light goes through, and part of the light gets reflected. It's the light that... So the beam path goes like this, it's here, and then goes through back to my hand here. And the other path goes from here to here, hits this mirror, comes back, and then hits the back side of the beam splitter. So then when you see my hand, um, the little dot on my hand here, there are actually two beams there, not just one. They're overlapping. And what I did is, made sure, is I made sure they're exactly together, like exactly overlapping each other. And I have to put this thing back because it's too bright and then we're going to come over here, and if I did everything correctly, let's see if we did everything correctly. Oh, it's still correct. Um, here, let me switch with you. Um, the light, the last thing it does is come into this. This is a little camera, and well, you can't see inside of it. Here, let's turn this on just so you can see inside of it. All right, I don't know if you guys can see inside of it. Down there, it doesn't look like much. Um, in fact, I don't even know if you can see inside of it very well. But uh, if you ever pull your camera apart, that's what measures. Uh, that's what measures everything. All right. So the cool thing is, is now that it hits the camera, now over here on this computer screen, I have something called an interference pattern. Oh, is it too bright? All right, sorry, it was too bright. So what you see there is called an interference pattern. And the cool thing about the interference pattern, uh, raise your hand if you see the, the dark spots and the bright spots. I don't see any hands raised. Uh, dark spots and bright spots, do you see those? Still not seeing any hands raised. Maybe? Oh, I do see one hand. Ethan back there says he sees it. All right. So from one bright spot to another bright spot is one interference fringe. And that, does, it looks like it's more on my computer screen, but if you shrunk it down to the size that it really is measuring, it's measuring a difference of 1 50th the width of a human hair. It's measuring something really, really small. Right, so, so, so go back there to the pattern. I mean, see if you can get the pattern in my See it jump? Probably jumped about 10 or 12 feet. 
So basically, I'm just barely touching this. And this, this stuff is all bolted down. It's steel. It's tough. Uh, and I'm just barely touching it. And you see that those, those spots are moving all over. So we use this in physics to measure uh, really, really small things. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Do I have any other tricks? Um, oh, I didn't say anything. How much time did we have? Okay, all right. Then we started the time. All right. Anyone know what this is? Uh, it's a black piece of something, right? I'm going to touch the back side of it with my finger. I'm going to blow it. So this is, this is a strip of liquid crystal. If any of you guys have ever had a mood ring, this is what's inside of there. Um, and uh, the reason I have these is because uh, I, have, I have a laser that you can't see. Like you, with your eyeball, you can't see it. However, it generates enough heat that you can stick this in the beam and you can tell where the beam is. Um, we'll do that one more time. Uh, here you go. So here it is, and I'm just going to put my finger on the back of it. Ready? Right, so it's measuring my finger, so it's turned blue. Uh, and basically what the liquid crystal does is measure temperature. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, there we go. There's my thumb. My thumb's warming up the paper. So I cheated. Uh, it's, uh, I, I stuck it in the hotel refrigerator. So I made it cold and I stuck my finger on after that. All right, so I'm going to tell you guys a couple of stories um, about becoming a mad scientist. And I, I get to play with lots of cool things like lasers and cameras, and I can't tell you some of this stuff because I work for the Navy and I have to tell you. So... But you're in North Carolina, but trust me. Well, maybe I'll. <laughs> I can't tell you that. All right. So I'm just going to tell you some stories not about that stuff. Um, I don't know how many of you guys know this, but I grew up in Franklin. How many of you guys know where Franklin is? Yeah. And, uh, and so I've spent lots of time in Franklin and in Murphy and Andrews. And when I... I didn't know I wanted to be a scientist. Like I didn't even know what an engineer was. And I just knew I liked to play with Legos because Legos were really cool. And uh, I like to build forts in the woods. Um, how many? So I always thought that it would be cool to uh, I like build a teeter-totter. And not just your normal everyday like two feet off the playground teeter-totter. I thought it would be fun to build a teeter-totter it was eight feet tall in the middle. And I thought this would be like really awesome. And but I discovered something interesting uh, in the process of building this teeter topper. I can't tell you what I what I learned just yet. Um, so my brother Chad, he was my lab assistant. Somehow I always managed to rope him into everything I did. And we went out, we cut down some trees, and we built a frame, and we, we got this one tree. It was like twenty five feet long, and we chopped up all the branches at for the for the for the bar in the middle. And we finally got this thing put together. It was eight feet tall in the middle. I'm serious. It was really tall. And I'm not quite sure how I convinced Chad to do this. He always got the dirty work, I think. I made him crawl out, I made him crawl out to the other end, like 16 feet off the ground, while I sat on the other end. And But we discovered something really... Uh, we discovered some... Well, I don't know that I discovered anything. It didn't work. And I didn't know until later why it didn't work. Um, but we never could get it to go up. Like, I couldn't jump high enough to make it switch and go down on the other side. And so we had this huge monstrosity of a teeter-totter sitting out in the driveway for, like, two years, and it didn't do anything. And I want you to know something about stuff like that that doesn't work. And that's that it's okay. If you build something and it doesn't work, uh, find out why. Learn from it. When something doesn't work, that doesn't mean it's that doesn't mean that, that life is over. It just means it didn't work. I've I've had lots of things that didn't work. So when I was in high school, and I I didn't go to uh, I didn't go to like a high tech high school where there was lots of like computers and stuff. Uh, when I went to high school, we did things like milking cows and.
and I mean, we did algebra and tree and all that stuff, but, but I milked cows and I drove tractors, uh, worked in the welding shop, did woodworking. Trees? Oh, I froze for a second, sorry. The stuff that I did wasn't super high tech. I was just working with my hands all the time, building stuff. Uh, I built a go kart in the welding shop. I thought that was cool. I built a, a lamp stand and wood. And I learned to clean a floor really, really well. And none of that stuff sounds super high tech because it's not super high tech. You know, all of, if you're a kid, you, know, you, you vacuum the floor sometimes, you clean the floor. You know, those those were things that I did. Yeah, it, it, maybe it's not so super cool and awesome. But using your hands and learning how to do stuff with your hands is probably the most important thing you can do right now to prepare to be a mad scientist. Um, when, I was in, well, when, I, when I was in high school, I met my friend Jason. Now, Jason was really cool. He was a senior, and I was a freshman. And uh, if, you, if you've been to high school, you know that, that seniors don't normally talk to freshmen. But Jason was cool. He talked to me. I was a freshman. And Jason was an artist, a philosopher, and he was really creative. And when he went off to college, uh, he came back to visit sometimes, and he told me about some cool stuff he was doing with lasers and holograms. And uh, he wanted to build something called an optical computer. And I had no idea what that was, but it sounded really cool. And when I got to college, uh, I actually took over Jason's project that he was trying to do when he went to college. Because Jason kind of did it for a while, and he got bored and went out and did something else. And I kind of worked on it for a while, and the same thing happened. You know, I kind of got bored and went out to do something else because I couldn't figure it out. It was too complicated. But while I was there, I learned how to uh, make holograms. Have you guys ever seen holograms? Anyone? Raise your hand seen holograms? I love holograms. They're so cool. And I was super excited, and I made lots of holograms, but I never could get them to do what I wanted them to do with the laser. And but in the basement, we had this dark room, and we'd shut off all the lights, and we'd turn on the laser, and we had a sand table and uh, inner tubes to isolate the vibrations. And you guys saw how sensitive that uh, that interferometer was when I touched it and all the fringes went past. Well, when you make holograms, it's really, really sensitive. Like You can't have vibrations. You can't touch anything. You can't hardly breathe on it, or it won't turn out right. And so I started learning a little bit about lasers and optics. But it still didn't work because it was kind of over my head. I mean, I, I didn't understand how do you make an optical computer with holograms. I read about it on the internet, but I didn't really understand what I was doing. And so, again, the main point here is that just because it doesn't work doesn't mean you're not learning anything. And it's necessary along the way for getting success that you are willing to take some failure with. And so I had some success. We built holograms. They were really cool. I can't. You know, I think I made one of a teddy bear and a, a, a ring and some other things. That, they looked cool, but I'm, I'm not even sure where they are now. I, I think I used to have them in a shed somewhere, but I think I got something that broke. They were glass. So I had some success, but I never did make that optical computer. And the truth is, no one's made an optical computer. But I got really excited about optical computers because of my friend Jason. And so when I got done with college, I, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And my professor said, well, you need to go to graduate school. Huh, what is that? That sounds like more school. I'm not sure I'm excited about that. Um, but he convinced me that that might actually be fun. And, and I told him, OK, well, if I go back, I think the, I think I want to go make optical computers. And so I got on the internet. And you're, you're going to have a hard time believing this. But I was using a browser in one of the first years that you had visual browsers. I don't know if any of you knew the internet before there were browsers. They had a browser called Links. There were no pictures. It was just text. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys ever seen like a command line type stuff. And that was really boring. But that was the year that we started being able to browse the internet. And there were pictures. And there was like websites. And it was really cool. And I started looking up universities and finding out what other people were doing with optical computing and found out about something called nonlinear optics. And so when I went to grad school, I thought that I would uh, make an optical computer. 
because I was going to go learn nonlinear optics and we were going to go off and make cool things. Well, I never did make an optical computer. In fact, like I said, no one's made an optical computer, but they're still kind of complicated. But I did work a lot with lasers. I, I love lasers. They're fun. And yes, I, I worked in a, in a lab where we closed all the curtains. It was really dark and we burnt holes in the curtains and the walls. And Yeah, we, we had a lot of fun with the lasers. You have to be careful where your phone post lenses. And then we used, so my research in graduate school uh, was around something called optical parametric oscillators. Don't worry about what that means. It's, I'm just going to call it an OPO. Right? So when I say an OPO, that's kind of like a laser, but it's it's a laser that can change colors. We'll just call it that. That's not really what it is, but it's close. And I had my first year. I got in the lab right away. I started tinkering around with this uh, this OPO, and some of the coolest colors I've ever seen in my life. I, mean, I, I don't even know how to describe it to you without showing it to you. Um, there's absolutely nothing else in the universe that looks like this. This is really, really cool. And I would spend hours and hours in the lab trying to make this OPO do things. And then my advisor says, well, we have this other crystal. And oh, by the way, you have to use infrared light so you can't see anything. And, oh, by the way, was visible. And so you had to come up with all kinds of tricks in order to see it. And so one day I was working on this, and I was only about a year and a half or two years into my, my graduate work. And I was one afternoon, I'll, I'll never forget this, I was tinkering around with stuff, and, and, and you don't really ever know what's exactly wrong. So you have to look at the front of everything, and you have to put beam stops in front of stuff. And it takes a long time to find out what happened. And so I had used the wrong lens, and I burnt a hole in the crystal. For the OPO. And I didn't know how bad that was, but I, I had a good look at it with a magnifying glass, and sure enough, there's a, there's a, a little black spot in the corner. And I went to my advisor and I says, I think I broke the crystals. And I'd ever broken anything more than maybe a couple hundred. Well, I guess I did wreck a car. Some of that counts. Um, but other than the car I wrecked, <laughs> experimenting, I'd probably never broken anything more than, I don't know, maybe $10 or $20 or something. And so when I broke something that was worth $7,000, That was probably the coolest thing that anyone ever told me because it gave me the confidence to try hard stuff. And now, now I've actually opened up lots of things that were hundreds of thousands of dollars, the laser systems. I mean, I'll just rip the top off and look inside. Okay, maybe more carefully. But I'm not afraid to take the screws out and, and defeat the interlocks and go looking for the problem. I mean, I've had my hand inside of laser power supplies that you know, that when the capacitors go off, I mean, it would totally like, fry a refrigerator or something. It's ridiculous amounts of power. Um, I worked with vacuum systems, and I'm not afraid to go try all of that stuff because my advisor told me, you know, it's just not a big deal. When you're trying to do something really cool, you're just going to end up breaking stuff once in a while. The goal is not to break stuff. The goal is to, to do it without breaking stuff. But there's always that risk. And so... I don't want you to be afraid to try stuff. I mean, you shouldn't try silly stuff, like it's, it's horribly like, dangerous or anything like that, but, but you need to explore. You need to go looking. You know, success feels really good, and it feels really good because it takes so much work, and you can't have significance in, in your life unless you're willing to risk failure. Now, we don't seek failure, like I said. We seek success. But 
it's inevitable that, that you'll fail, but those failures are bringing you closer and closer to your goal. That's what I want you to remember from your stories. If you want to become a math scientist or an engineer or a computer programmer, just get used, get comfortable with the idea that failure is just a part of that process. All right. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, and uh, I've tried lots of cool things. I can't tell you about all of them, but I'm willing to take some questions. Uh, but you have to turn the audio back on. I'm going to plug my headphones in so they'll get feedback. Okay. All right. Um, still not hearing anything. Is the audio back on yet? Ooh, there's a question from TJ. Hi, TJ. I saw you sitting there, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm, you guys are still muted. I'm not hearing anything. Someone want to come hit the door. Oh, oh, there we go. Yeah, do you want me to unmute it? Yeah, we're good. All right, so what's TJ's question? Can you hear us from here? Yeah, I think. Oh, we haven't been working with lasers. How long have I been working with lasers? How long have I been working with lasers? Probably well, over 20 years. 20 years. I had to think about that. I, when I was in college, was the first time I used the laser. She's saying we missed part of the 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 uh, audio went out so we missed part of the story on the how did the uh, crystal actually break that broke how did it break how did it break I think I used a lens and was it had too short a focal length too high, too too high. And, and the laser was just so intense the crystal that it just broke the whole thing. Uh, we had one more question was uh, what kind of crystal was it uh, something called silver gallium sulfur, and I, I asked I asked the friend Gary Keller, Gary is the guy who made the crystal. He works at a little company in Cleveland, Ohio, and he said the reason those crystals are so expensive is because they take a long time to grow. Grow, and after you grow them, in order to polish them, you can put a laser to them. He said it's putting them out on the surface, kind of like. Kind of like Trying to find out jello. I think that's all the questions we have time for, Steve. Thank you so much. Alrighty. Alrighty. Well, thank you guys. Thank you lots of fun. We'll see you guys this summer at Inventor Camp. Make sure you know it's going to be in June. There should be flyers up if you haven't seen them already. So. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Bye. 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 Bye.